All right. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us at the National Young Writers Festival, whether you are online or in person, finally, uh, and hanging out at the baths, though I have heard that they might be closed. Anyway, we're not thinking about that. Uh, welcome to our session on cultivating care. We're going to be talking about all sorts of things related to self-care, community care, how you can embody some of those practices in your work, and maybe we'll pick up some tips and tricks from one another on how to do it better for ourselves as well. Uh, but before we launch into the conversation, I just want to take a moment to acknowledge the true custodians of the lands on which I'm broadcasting from, the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung people of the Eastern Kulin Nations, and just acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded. This was and always will be Aboriginal land. And I extend respect to elders past and present and recognise that a conversation around cultivating care on colonised land uh, has a lot of different kinds of connotations and that when we truly understand what cultivating care looks like, we also really need to look to the First Nations custodians and those who have been the protectors of this land for tens of thousands of years and, and onto their leadership. So I want to hold that in my heart as we move across this conversation. So my name is Nivozisan. Hi, I use they, them pronouns. Uh, I'm an author. I've written a couple of books on gender stuff to nonfiction books. Uh, and I run workshops in schools and workplaces around trans identities. My speaking is a little bit more than my writing, but I write sometimes as well. <laughs> um, and I'm going to throw it to the others. Grace, if you wanted to introduce yourself first. Thanks. Thank you so much, Navo. And yeah, it's really exciting to be here. Um, my name is Grace Chan. My pronouns are she, her. Um, I am a speculative fiction writer. I adore everything specfic. And I have a bunch of short stories published and my debut novel, Every Version of You, came out last month. Um, I, in terms of my day, oh, thank you. <laughs> in terms of my day job, um, I work as a doctor. So I finished my training in psychiatry last year, which was um, an incredibly gruelling process and had a pretty big impact on my well-being um, and I am actually not working at the moment because I'm parenting a little baby <laughs> um, so... I was gonna be like oh I'm so glad you've had a bit of a break after you know <laughs> yeah. being a doctor and writing a book and you're like parenting a little baby <laughs> like yeah. oh my goodness <laughs> <laughs> that's what I was thinking before the baby arrived as well but it's definitely not so much a break <laughs> um, but yeah I'm really really looking forward to this chat um, as I was saying before the panel, um, being programmed on a cultivating care panel prompted me to reflect a lot on my relationship with creativity and how it can be sustainable and also the, you know, that it's such an independent, an individual thing for each person and the privilege that I have and also the weaknesses that I um, was reflecting on thinking about the way that I can bring care into, into my work and into my practice. So really looking forward to this discussion. Hi, um, I'm Ren. I use they and she pronouns. Um, and I am a poet um, and theatre maker and editor and very recent screenwriter. Um, it's very exciting um, to be moving um, towards screen. Um, yeah, uh, resonating with what Grace said, it's been really nice to kind of have this opportunity to just, I like actually stop and think about um, what are some ways that we can um, practice care uh, as creatives and yeah very keen to get started. Cool well I guess that's kind of a great segue to the first question which is like what are some examples of ways that maybe you have cultivated care within the last week just some kind of tangible ways of doing that. Grace do you want to launch us off? Yeah I guess getting just thinking about my last week there isn't a lot of sitting and writing and I've had to be okay with that. So, I mean, at the moment, my days are just really caught up with doing. So just looking after a baby and looking after someone else's needs and catching, sort of playing catch up with the, the admin side of writing. So catching up with the promo and the publicity that goes on um, when you release a debut novel into the world, as I've discovered. <laughs> Um, which is not not really my favourite part of um, creating. It's not 
not so much my thing. It doesn't come so naturally to me, I think. And it's all very new, so, you know, coming to terms with that process. So in terms of practical self-care that I've been doing over the last week, it feels like a bit of a mess, to be honest. (laughs) It's been about letting go. I think um, Mm. letting go of what I think creativity should look like, that it has to be a certain way, that I have to, you know, produce, you know, this amount of words here, you know, in a day or um, be be working on this story. So, and it's it's been about being okay with not making anything for stretches of time as well and just, mm. you know, doing other things, whether that's caring for someone else or living or doing the admin side of, of creative um, work, um, taking a break. Um, yeah, just little practical things have been taking a nap when I absolutely need one, going for a walk and getting some fresh air, saying no to certain things, uh, asking for this panel to be delayed by a few days (laughs) because I had a cold (laughs) and saying, oh, maybe I can actually ask for, you know, um, something to, to be postponed. So, yeah, on that note, I think I've reflected a bit on the fact that Mm, perfectionism and anxiety are things that I have had to grapple with as I work um, to figure out how to maintain a sustainable creative practice Um, and that's something that I continue to to work on over to you (laughs) (laughs) whoever wants Navoa or Ren. Ren do you want to go for it? Mm, Yeah um, I really am feeling um, what you were saying Grace about like learning to let go of needing to be working on something all the time um, and that it's okay to be like taking breaks where you're not working on anything at all Um, I think I feel a lot of sort of like I think a lot of the time it's like self-imposed pressure and stress on on there being like oh I have to have you know like a a goal for the whole year to have finished this or or, you know by the end of this month I need to have gotten I'm writing a feature length screenplay at the moment um and it's like that was my goal for the year um and I have tried so many times to (laughs) um break it down into like monthly schedules of like okay by the end of August um I need to have finished you know like gotten up to like scene 35 or like whatever (laughs) um and it's just like no matter how much I try to kind of be like I must get this done I must get this done it just always kind of something will happen and then you know I'll, I'll need I really need a week off and I just can't do it this week and I and because you know what I do another job that I have is in like social media like content creation so that is also I guess it's like an adjacent part of the brain that is thinking about images and ideas and and communication and I'm just kind of often finding myself sitting at a desk for the whole day kind of just rocking back and forth (laughs) hugging my knees um head is empty brain is so smooth um there is nothing in there at all (laughs) um that um really just I think actively reminding myself that like it's it's nice it's nice to set goals for myself and and try to be organized but it is also at the end of the day it needs to um work with how I'm yeah like keeping myself well um in all the other ways as well so I've been finding um as many opportunities just to move my body as possible um I played badminton in a little gay badminton club every week (laughs) Um, and it's really nice it's the two hours a week where I just turn my brain off completely um I've always loved playing badminton like since I was little um and like last year I was like I'm just gonna like why not like social sport is great how have I not gotten into it before um and yeah that's been really nice to kind of just use a different Mm. part of my body um every once in a while cool yeah I love what you've both spoken so much around like surrender like just actually allowing the self-care to not come and that almost being a form of self-care like that this week is like not the week for it or um yeah I'm just thinking a lot about the sort of pressures that I felt especially like because for me I got published before I really became a writer in a way which was kind of weird and then entered like the writing scene and people were like if you want to be a good writer you need to be writing every day and you need to be reading all the time and all this stuff and I was like I don't even know that I like writing that much. Like I'm not even convinced that this is like a passion of mine Mm -hmm. and was so just like so hard on myself all the time about it. And I remember it wasn't until like actually being in lockdown where I was looking at different artists that I like aspired to be like or books that I really wanted to write and 
I just kept having this thought that was like, I actually have no idea if these artists that I look up to are good friends or good family members. I don't know if they pick their kids up from school. I don't know if they do their like fair share of domestic tasks. Like, I don't know if they're going and visiting their parents in nursing homes. And I don't want to actually sacrifice those things in my life in order to write a great book. Like, I don't want to be remembered for great art. I want to be remembered for showing up for the people that actually really mattered to me. And it made me realize that if my goal in life is not to write five books or be really good at art or anything, um, then maybe my goal could just be to show up for people and to be a good friend. And that could be what I'm focused on. Um, So, yeah, that kind of changed things for me a little bit. And I guess, like, that idea of surrender is a big one. Like, lately I think I've been quite tired and a bit drained. So I've been, you know, allowing myself to, yeah, have a nap or um, pre-make some meals before I start my work week or um, not read because sometimes reading is really hard and just, like, watching Netflix over and over again. The problem is that I usually... (laughs) I usually allow myself to do whatever I want, so I do need to be a little bit more disciplined. Um, But I want to talk a little bit, Grace, about what you mentioned before, like this idea of creative work being this kind of double-edged sword and it, you know, brings you joy and it helps you process the world but can also be really demanding and draining and, like, how do you sort of find that balance or negotiate which of those things are activated in you at any given time? I just wanted to say, Neva, that um, that that whole thing you just said about balancing creative work with just being a person in general was so, like, really hit home. I think I teared up a little bit. <laughs> like, well, it's yeah. just so interesting because it's like, I mean, especially the Australian publishing industry, it's like the pinnacle is to get a book published, right? And then if you yeah. do get a book published... Then what happens? You have to get another book published within a year if you want to stay on the writers' festival circuit and you're lucky to (laughs) even, like, break even with your royalties. And if that's the pinnacle and you work so hard to get there, then, like, what what else is there to offer a holistic life, you know? Yeah, I think it's a really good reminder that the creative work that you're doing, sure, it is a really important part of who you are as a person, but it's also important to nurture the other parts of you, the other the other things that um, give you a sense of like engaging with life and relating to people around you because I think you need all of those things to continue to to create in a way that is meaningful and you were you brought up the point about um, how, like how I relate to creative work and I'm sure um, it, it you know keen to hear all of your thoughts on it as well that for me writing has been a a lifesaver in many ways it's sort of been a way for me to it sounds a bit cheesy but it is a way for me to reconnect with myself um, over the years and a way for me to I think find my own voice and um, figure out what I feel and think about the world around me Um, and also a bridge for me to connect with people um, by reading their work and by people reading my work and um, it's been very powerful um, to realize that hey I can create something and put it out there and you know it it does create a bridge with with people out there Mm -hmm. um yeah but at the same time I think kind of bouncing off a little bit what you said Neva it can become a little bit of a tunnel if you let it um as well like you can get a bit caught up in what you should be doing or what other people are doing or you know, how many short stories are other people submitting? Oh, my goodness, I'm not submitting enough. I've only submitted, like, one this whole year, (laughs) you know. Um, And it can, you can kind of get a bit caught up in maybe taking on other people's goalposts as your own. So, like, this year with my debut novel coming out and um, feeling a bit more, like, you know a real writer and having stuff out there it's like I've got to I've had to kind of sit back and go what makes me happy in my creative work like it's it's I can't let it be about um um you know what what other people think of the work how other people respond to it it's got to be something that comes from 
a, a sort of personal satisfaction that comes from um, what I'm trying to say or what I'm trying to do with my writing. So it's about, I think it's been about figuring out um, what it is that I want to, what are my personal goals in terms of creating this work and not being drawn aside by comparisons or what I should be doing and that kind of thing. Um, and also, also, I guess, when you, when you send out a work into the world, um, needing to kind of separate yourself a little bit from it as well. This is something I've created. This is a piece that I've created. I'm going to put it out there and how people respond to it is, you know, they're going to see it through their own lens. Um, and that's, that's okay. It's like releasing it into the wild. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I really love that. I love that, like, taking a moment to actually sit back and be like, who is this creative practice for and, mm -hmm. and what versions of it feel really good for me or what versions feel like that kind of grind culture that I need to produce in order to, like, stay relevant or, like, be in the cultural zeitgeist. And mm -hmm. um, I think having those moments of reflection and also separating yourself from those creative pursuits are, are really important. Mm -hmm. How does that resonate for you, Ren, especially moving across a lot of different sort of genres and styles of writing? Like, are there some styles that you find easier to connect with your creativity and are more for you and others that are more for, like, getting out there or accomplishing goals? Mm. Um, yeah, definitely. I was just thinking about how um, the way that I experience creating work across different genres feels very different um, for me in that, like, I feel like, uh, when I'm working on poetry, a lot of the times it is it, it is me. <laughs> it began with me screaming into the void and just hoping that somebody catches it. Um, and that has been, I think, a really nice experience to kind of be able to share, um, I guess, like the unfiltered version <laughs> um, of uh, when I'm, I think especially a few years ago when I was, um, I think, focusing a lot of like exploring my identity um, and trying to work out who I am and how I want to be um, that writing poetry was really more the focus back then um, whereas I think uh, recently um, I felt really yeah like privileged and, and thankful and happy to be working um, more in performance because I do find sometimes that uh, writing like published writing or yeah, um, can be lonely in that it is just me uh, with my, yeah, whatever device I'm writing on um, and just my feelings. <laughs> um, whereas it feels really special um, in a completely different way to kind of have a script and bring into a room and, um, you know, pre-lockdown when I was directing as well to kind of be working with a group of people where that kind of becomes our collective, like it's our story that we're all kind of sharing together um, that that has been, yeah, I mean, like, I feel like with any kind of like major project compared to me just writing a poem, like infinitely more stressful and a lot more work and I come away kind of needing to really just take a couple months off and breathe, but also at the same time to kind of, yeah, like walk into a room with a script and have people, you know, perform it and work on it and shape and mould it and kind of make it their own and turn it into something that we've all experienced together and then bring it to an audience. It's like, yeah, it's a really nice feeling um, that, you know, to have gone through that whole process um, where we're all stressing together um, and all needing care together, but also at the same time um, giving it, giving care to each other. Um, it's been really special. Yeah, I really love that idea as well of like finding new genres that suit you in the stage of life that you are then in. Like I mm. really loved what you said about, you know, kind of reflecting on poetry being particularly pertinent for a certain stage of life and also now really craving some of that like collaborative teamwork and, and feeling your writing come to life in a really different way, which I think is yeah. cool because sometimes it's like, we're just sort of made into a, like genre specific sort of writers. And it's like, well, you write poetry or you write fiction. It's like, I have no idea what I write. Like at school, we studied a million subjects just to find out what we might um, enjoy, you know? Uh, mm. So yeah, I really, I like that idea. And also that you don't have to maintain all of those genres either, that you might just be moving from one form to a different one. And um, yeah, I think that's, I think that's really cool. 
because I really relate to that as well. Like for me, poetry has always been like kind of my personal art form. Like that's the one that I really love. I keep close to my heart. I only perform it sometimes and I always feel really connected to it. Whereas like the books that I've written are essentially like somewhat like 101 guides for cis people to stop being jerks. And I don't feel super connected to that because it wasn't really for me like it was for me at 16 and it's for like lots of trans and gender diverse young people now so that they don't have to do that educational work but when it comes to like my creative spiritual self like that person wants to write things that are much less like educational and much more like what the hell was that I'm confused um you know like when I first (laughs) when I wrote my first um fiction piece that got published I decided to write like a really weird horror story that was like super abstract, which I've never written anything like that before. But I just didn't want to write like contemporary fiction because I felt like people would expect that from me. And then the like Goodreads reviews were like, this story was so weird. I have no idea what happened. And I was just so stoked about it because I've never been mysterious in my life. Like I'm so obvious I'm just always you know saying it exactly how it is and that was like so creatively fulfilling for me to just be like wow people really didn't understand that I love that like I feel like a cool real writer now you know um which is yeah funny and weird and I guess like that also ties into um what we've been discussing about these ideas of like where we need to be in our career or in our lives. Again, I think that ties into different forms because, um, because you know, I think we have these ideas of like a linear career trajectory and that if we swap over to a different form or we move to a different genre, we're like starting back from scratch. So, yeah, I wonder like if you could speak on that, Ren, um, a little bit about, you know, prioritising care and well-being and, and moving at your own pace with your career and not like on the escalator Mm. totally yeah um it feels I kind of brought that up because it feels very relevant right now because I'm applying for um further study um because I'm trying to go to go go to film school um but also at the same time kind of it's brought me back to that kind of feeling like I actually am I doing it because I will feel like I would really benefit from going back to uni and doing assignments and learning in that format or am I doing it because I feel like I would never be taken seriously as a director or I wouldn't get projects or, you know, without having a degree? Um, and I don't have an answer for that yet because I literally just spent the day trying to write a personal statement. So um, come back to me in two weeks and we'll see how it goes. Um, but, yeah, definitely, like, it's very much something that I'm still trying to to figure out um So I think all I'm managing to do at the moment is to kind of just stop. I ask myself those questions um, on, yeah, is this something that I'm doing because it would actually really benefit me or that it's something that I really love or am I doing it because I see everybody else doing it and I'm afraid of missing out. Um, And I think that applies to like opportunities as well um, that I think especially as like emerging writers, we probably feel like we need to say yes to everything just just in case, just in case it turns out to be something useful, even if, you know, we really, we've said yes to five things today already. Um, and there's really just no time. Um, and so I think for me, I'm still in that kind of learning to recognize it stage and knowing that I need to kind of think and reflect about these things. Um, but we're still not, we're not quite there with knowing how to move through it just yet. Yeah. What about you two? Cool. Thanks, Ren. And and Grace, for you, like you already have an established career essentially and are now, you know, releasing this this book on on the side of that. Is that where you kind of want to move to? What does that look like for you in negotiating like how you imagine your career to be um, and how you prioritize care for yourself while also needing to prioritize the needs of a whole other human being that you're responsible for like that's a lot you have you have three careers going on right now so I'm like how do you do that I wish that I had an answer that made my life sound planned <laughs> but I do not um, and somehow things just 
I don't know, things just all happened at the same time. And I didn't, um, I didn't certainly didn't plan to have a book out and a baby out in the same year. Um, and I, I guess I'm just someone who, I, I guess I've just sort of um, sat not not sat back but just wanted to see where things would take me both in terms of my medical work and in terms of my writing work um, and I definitely do acknowledge the privilege that I have in my day job that I'm not dependent on my writing financially and I know that's not um, the situation for uh, many writers and that does allow me to have a bit more freedom in terms of my writing that I can go for stretches not writing um, and not be worried about, um, you know, needing to sell pieces of writing to pay the bills. And I do acknowledge that that is a significant um, um, privilege that I have in terms of my practice. Um, in terms of juggling the different commitments that I have, um, it's, I definitely don't have an answer to them, <laughs> to that. Um, and each of them, uh, that it has been difficult ch juggling the commitments of being a doctor, um, pursuing my passion of writing and also becoming a parent as well. Um, the two of those are things that are involve putting other people's needs before your own. So um, in my medical work and as a parent, I am constantly, um, sussing out what someone else's needs are and trying to meet them and that can be quite draining over time um, whereas writing for me is uh, in many ways some a way that I meet my own needs um, so it's a, a quite a uh, important meaningful pursuit for me personally to be able to write um, it sort of sustains me and helps me, as I said before, to kind of figure out what I think and feel about things happening around me and um, figure out who I am as a person as well. Um, I think, Ren, you mentioned that sense of yelling into the void to figure out, like, <laughs> who you are and what your voice sounds like, I think, is, is something that I can relate to. Um, so I guess what I'm saying is that all three, you know, being a doctor, trying to figure out how to be a writer and trying to figure out how to be a parent are things that I, um, I don't think any of them I could give up. But um, this year definitely has been a process of trying to jigsaw how I can sustainably keep going with all three of them um, and not completely, you know, end up in a corner <laughs> crying. <laughs> Um, and I think part of that has been um, one thing is one thing I did want to mention was sort of acknowledging and letting go of um, and addressing perfectionism and anxiety. Um, so, you know, for me, for a long time, I didn't want to didn't admit that I was a perfectionist. But now, now I do sort of think about the fact that, you know, perfectionism is, is, is not just about being obsessive or wanting everything to be perfect, but it's a bit of that that deep feeling of inadequacy when when you feel when you fall short of a standard or when you make a mistake. And so I've had to let go of that in my writing, in my medical work and as a parent, um, and be okay with making mistakes and doing things sleep deprived and not going over things for the hundredth time, um, because I think that can be detrimental to creativity and also not the best for my well-being. So um, that's been something that I've been reflecting on over the past few months. Yeah, thanks for sharing. And I really love what you said about, you know, the, the two sort of careers in your life as being very much dedicated to um, intuiting or putting other people's needs first and that your writing is very much for you. And I can see where that imperative to do that writing then comes from and, and drives you. And I think it's really beautiful to hear as well someone speak of it in such a like 
healing and and therapeutic way and not a like I need to get a book out or I need to like write and um, obviously yeah as you said there there are aspects of like privilege to that as well but I think it's also really beautiful to just see that as an embodiment of of um, of pleasure and like of passion and of something that really serves you um, which I think is really nice and also like speaks to what a shame it is of like how cap- like capitalized our art forms have become in which we have to like bleed the passion out of them in order to like pay bills or in order to stay relevant or and like what would that look like if we all had a basic income or like weren't having to hustle or grind in order to to kind of make those things prevalent which I think is you know obviously something that (laughs) I'm sure we all think about a lot um yeah I think for me like my career never really went in a normative way I mean nothing I've ever done has been normative because I'm like queer and trans and you know non-binary and non-monogamous and all those sorts of things so like that escalator of how society progresses has not always um been one that I could get onto uh but yeah I mean I was studying writing at the same time that my book came out and like really trying to finish this course hating university so much Um, and trying to balance all of these things until my poetry teacher was like, why don't you just drop out? And I was like, what? You can't say that. She was like, you're studying to do the thing that you're already doing. Like, it's taking away from your career, so maybe you should just focus on your career for a while and if you want to come back to study, you can. And, again, obviously, like, that's, that's a privilege to be able to, like, live your career before you finished uni, but... If it wasn't for that poetry teacher, I think I would have stayed at uni and I would have never written again. But instead, I, like, dropped out after a year and a half and I love going into unis and, like, being a guest lecturer and telling them that I'm, like, a uni dropout. Like, I never finished uni. I don't know if I'll ever go back. And I have a career that's, like, based in writing and speaking and all this sort of stuff, which I think is, is really cool. I think for me, I almost have that opposite Um like I definitely am like thinking about how my career is going to progress and stuff, but I think I also just like have gotten caught into a bit of a career life from a really young age. Like I started my career when I was 21 and I'm like, I need to find the space to also live my life. Like I need to find the space to be a bit like rep reckless and like a bit of a rat bag and not always be thinking about like well I've got work on Monday or you know like I've not really spent a lot of time just like letting go and being a kid or like being a teenager or being like you know in my adolescence and so I think for me it's about like carving that stuff out and doing quite a lot of work to like work through my internalized capitalism of like you know if I take off a month from work I'm like and then I go back to work and I need more time off and it's sort of like well you know lots of people don't get that kind of time and you had lots of time and it's like what do you mean like there is no quota of how much work we should be doing if you can get away with not working that's great like (laughs) we shouldn't feel like we have to work if we are in a position where we don't have to all the time I think that's like yeah I think that was also something that lockdowns offered me was like I had a lot of the the tools but, like, no idea of how to use them for how to actually cultivate rest. Like, any time i take a day off, I was just, like, stressing about not being productive or any time I would have a really fun day with my friends, I was, like, thinking about the next project I needed to do and it just meant that I wasn't actually present in my life. And then when, you know, everything stopped for a few months and I was like, oh, wow, like, my career won't just explode if I don't do anything for four months, people aren't going to forget me. I'm not going to become irrelevant. The urgency that is placed on us around producing work is false. It's like, it's not real. (laughs) That stuff will always be there for you. If you, you know, sit back and like go on a different career path and then want to publish a second book or then want to do this, like, that's fine. You know, that's an amazing thing. Um, And I think we need to like keep reminding ourselves and each other of that, that there is no one way trajectory that, you know, you're not not a writer because you're not reading at the moment. You can actually not read for years and come back to reading and that's fine. Like you can find other ways to engage. Like I think so many of those narratives are really just like elitist and often classist and just not acknowledging where people are actually at. So 
guess jumping off that, like for you, Grace, what has letting go of perfectionism looked like? How, how have been some of the ways that you've actually implemented that practice? Yeah, wow. I was just absorbing everything you were saying, Navo, and um, I really like that point that you're making about how um, writing doesn't have to, or creating doesn't have to look a particular way and it, you don't have to be, you know, just forced into the grind of producing, producing, producing. And it's so, you know, I'm a big believer that it is really, really vital to um, take, you know, take breaks from creating and let yourself just live and grow as a person and do other things and reflect and read if you feel like it. And um, yeah, I think that touched on um, Ren, uh, your point that you made in um, an email um, around um learning and reminding yourself that there are no definitive rules to um, where you need to be in career or life in general and um, kind of destroying the idea of limited time. So I'm really keen to hear your further thoughts on, on that as well. Um, and it reminds me of, um, I went to listen to Jessica Au, the author of um, uh, Cold Enough for Snow recently. And she mentioned that she had a 10 year gap between her debut novel and then writing Cold Enough for Snow, which is just an amazing novel. And um, and I just think that's so, um, you know, that that's a lovely point to share that, you know, creative a creative life can look however, you know, it doesn't have to look a certain way. And um, there can be big gaps between um, times when you um, put out creative work. Um, I went off on a bit of a tangent. Your question was around <laughs> perfectionism and what I've been doing to challenge it. <laughs> um, but I think, I mean, I think it's really, I, I just want to jump off from that as well because I think it's really interesting of like, yeah, I mean, these these ideas around urgency and, and having to produce work mm. and it's like, let's just be real for a moment. Like the better your work is, does not mean the more success it will have not in this mm. landscape not in this economy not in this like system of so many different oppressive forces and i think that that's really important to remember as well that you know even as you were saying grace like in order to sell your book like you have to do a bunch of publicity for the most part writers are not forward facing public speakers you know like that's not a lot of writers are like weird hermit introverts and that's great and that's like a whole <laughs> part of the thing you know um and I think that that's really important to remember too because it's like this idea of like meritocracy and like if you work hard you will get places and I do still believe that like you know if you really put your passion and your heart into things and you pursue it that that those opportunities will come to you but i think it's also really important especially for for young writers who are out there to know that like just because you're like doing the grind doesn't mean you'll get there and it, and it is important sometimes to take a step back and to actually like live your life and experience joy and research for your writing by actually living like and going out there you know I have friends who are like some of the most brilliant authors that I've ever read and they are struggling to get book deals and they've already had books published you know like that's that's so tough and I remember the amount of times that I've not written because I'm like I haven't read the canon but I don't even like read all that much and like I shouldn't write at all and it's like at the end of the day like people don't always want the most literary work. They also just want something vulnerable and authentic and that they can connect with. And if that means that you spent 12 years like journaling and learning about yourself and going to therapy and negotiating, you know, important like transformative justice principles and nonviolent communication and being really in touch with oneself, that might actually produce better writing than reading a bunch of books, potentially, you know. Um, so I think that reframing is important because, yeah, when I got into the literary scene, even at the National Young Writers Festival, I remember hearing writers be like, if you don't read all the time, you're a bad writer or like, this is how many books I read per year. And I was like, oh, my God, I should just stop right now. And it, it's just like you have no idea whose lives you might change with the work that you do. Like it doesn't 
it's not about how many people have read your book or how many stars you have on Goodreads or anything like that. It's, it's about, you know, honoring yourself and honoring where you're at. And if you're not actually in a place to write another book, it's going to show, you know, it's going to show in your writing and what you're doing. And so like, if that project is just like not getting through, maybe, maybe it is time to like give it a little bit of a break and take a step away from it and think about what you actually need. Um, but yeah, I mean, please continue with the perfectionism. <laughs> <laughs> Plus, you know, the ability to spend heaps of time reading and submitting your stuff everywhere, that's got so many other factors that play into it as well, like finances, class, you know, you know, you have to have time to be able to do those kinds of things. Um, yes, back to perfectionism. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I guess it's just that acknowledging I think that perfectionism does play a role in um how I how I um, relate to my creative work like my writing so acknowledging that you know to a degree it can be helpful to be a bit obsessive about about what you're making um you know if I'm working on a short story um, I can get really stuck into it and turn it over in my head for days. And then when I'm redrafting, I just love kind of going over and over it again and really turning it into something that I um, feel satisfied with. But um, also recognizing that um, it can get to a point where it's not so helpful. So um, when I've read it aloud to myself for the third time, it's probably a time to say, hey, um, that degree of obsessiveness maybe isn't so helpful to my creativity and I can let go and um, let the piece just speak for itself by that point. Um, and I think that that self-editing as well, so like um, sort of jumping in with your inner critic and kind of um, maybe even like inhibiting your own um, thoughts before you even put them down on the page. That can be an aspect of, of perfectionism as well. So I think just recognising that, that inner critic when it comes out and learning to kind of go, hey, you know, that voice isn't helpful um, has been a big part of things. And a lot of that um, has been definitely, you know, going to to having my own therapy and acknowledging, um, you know, understanding the way that my brain works has um, been extremely uh, an important part of that process. Um, I guess a bit of that ties into, like, it's a funny thing as a writer to, to have anxiety because you're constantly putting your work out there and you're like, here's my work, now everyone read it and, you know, think what you, you know, I'm just going to put myself out there for everyone to read and think what you will of what um, I think and feel. So it's quite a funny um, fear, I think, for a writer to have, but I think a, a common one as well. So I think a lot of it is about that, that thing that we touched on before around separating yourself from your work as well and finding um, the joy in your work that comes from yourself and not from the you know not from other people um so figuring out a way that um the creative practice that you have in your life it's not um it's it, it's a jigsaw piece of the person that you are and something that um is sustainable um in 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 the longer term yeah <laughs> easier said than done i think <laughs> totally Thanks, Grace. Ren, do you want to speak on this this idea of perfectionism? Yeah, totally. Um, it is definitely something that I really um, relate to as well. But I'm noticing, like, particularly this year, um, that, yeah, like, actively and, like, openly living as a queer trans person and being around people in community who um, are also exploring and, and learning and creating um, has been yeah like saving my life in so many aspects because it's showing me that everything is a work in progress and that time is fake um and I have you know gone back and read things that I thought was perfect three years ago I went this is a complete piece of shit <laughs> um and I know I feel that way about something that I feel like is perfect now um five years from now you know I'll I, I think it's uh 
really interesting yeah like as you know writer artist whatever kind of creative that's putting your work out there that is it's always kind of archived there for you to come back and and see what you were doing at that particular point in your life um to kind of yeah like reevaluate like what does it actually mean like who is deciding when something is done and like perfect or, or good um that in a way now then it feels uh yeah like almost really special to kind of be like I, I guess in my context it's like you know to have this play show be developed and then the audience is coming in and you're sitting there being like what if they hate it like what if they don't laugh at the points that I you know that we put in there like what if they don't react in the way that you know what if people go out and like everyone hates it um that it is almost a, a really special experience to kind of be like I get these people are here to witness the who I am in this stage of my life um and you know I might feel really good about it now but I might feel shit about it five years later just like how I may feel shit about it now but I may feel like that was actually like a really you know like a useful or, or um important part um of my career or, or life in general to have gone through um so I think um yeah I mean I definitely still like struggle with it that I don't I can't quite leave it alone unless I've submitted it or given it to someone else um but it has really helped to kind of yeah or one kind of live around people who are you know perhaps a bit further along in working on kind of whether that be like their creative work and life balance or or how creating fits into how they see themselves and it, yeah so for me it's been like a whole kind of general shift um that I'm noticing rather than just kind of in my creative work which has been um really tough but also really good yeah cool thank you yeah I think it's it's super interesting as well to hear about how people negotiate those things because I think for me you know I like e even hearing you say grace before like now that I have a book out and like feeling like a real writer and I think like for me my imposter syndrome like because my process was like getting a book out very like early on my imposter syndrome was like someone's given me a book deal I don't know why or how and I I, I haven't like earned my place in the writing community yet and I think that in a way that was kind of really useful for me because you know people were like oh like without rejection letters like you don't even really know what it's like or with all this sort of stuff and um, I listened to a podcast recently about perfectionism and it was talking about like ways of overcoming it and um, which is also a classic me. This one time I said to my friend, like, I'm really going to work on my perfectionism. Like that's my like focus at the moment. And they were like, okay, cool. Do you think maybe you're like embodying some of that perfectionism in the way that you're trying to, you know, it's like, okay, I can see that. Um, but anyway, he was talking about how one of his like recovery from perfectionism tendencies is to like, have a quota of failures that he has to have through the year like he has to fail five times in the year at something and so when it happens he's like oh great that's like one of my that's one of my quota that's awesome because no one is perfect like we all fail and we all make mistakes and actually if you are doing everything perfectly or at a standard that you're really happy with that probably means that you're not taking any risks that you are like just working within your comfort zone and so I really thought about that and, you know, the last like year and a bit has been an opportunity for me to try and fail, like to actually put myself in positions that I haven't been before. And I've been, you know, applying for some like fellowships or some writing mentorships and things that I've never done before because I only ever really wrote to things that I was like asked to write, which again is very much my comfort zone because I'm being asked to write on things that I like already really know um and I got my first rejection and I was like oh like now I feel like a real writer like I feel like I have less imposter syndrome now because I'm like I got rejected I feel so good about it um and then I I like got one of the things and I was like oh that's so cool like I would never have applied for something like this if I wasn't trying to fail like if that wasn't my goal and it meant that instead of being like oh, I failed, I was like, oh, or like, oh, yeah, I've succeeded. Like, that's what I would expect. I was like, I never expected to succeed. Like, this is so cool. And maybe it means that I can take some of those risks. And yeah, I think that idea ran of like looking back on old pieces that you would have thought were perfect and then being like, oh, that sucks now. Like, 
I think it's really nice to be like, uh, what I have written today is maybe not amazing, but I also don't want it to be because I want to have lots of space to grow to. But what I can say is that it's better than what I've written before. You know, it's better than where I was at a different point in time. And um, I really, I really love that. And it reminds me of this, like, this meme or something that I saw on the internet that was like, you really hate and resent your art because you feel like it, it, it sounds or looks too much like yours. Like it's too typical of you or it's too much like your voice or something. And so you keep trying to sort of be a different kind of writer, a different kind of artist. It's like, that's actually the best thing that you have to offer the world is that your art is inherently you and no one else really knows that. No one's tracking your creative pursuits that closely with like a fine tooth comb to be like, oh, that's typical. Like Grace uses that language all the time in her work. You know, it's like that's actually the, the best thing that you have. And I think when we can get into that mind frame of like failure is amazing, it means that you're taking risks. You know, what you're writing is better than you've ever written before. Um it might not be amazing, but that means that you have so much further to grow to and it sounds like you because it is you and that's awesome because you're the only one writing like that in the world. Um, I think that like those have been my kind of pragmatic steps of getting out of perfectionism and, and allowing for like there to be room to to fail or, or to, you know, to grow. I, I just wanted to jump in and say I love the points that both of you made, um, Ren, your point about there being no perfect piece and that just kind of made me reflect on the stuff that I've written over the years and the fact that, you know, none of it's perfect but all of it is a little bit of a, uh, I guess, like you wouldn't have written the next one if you hadn't written the one before and it's quite interesting always uh, interesting to look back on the stuff you've written in the past and go hey this is a kind of a bit of a memento to who I was at the time and um, I'm not that person anymore but it's also a piece of my body of work and I think that's a really nice way to view creating actually so thank you for that. <laughs> um, Especially because something that I often say in writing workshops is that like all of the writers that you look up to have a pile of crap way bigger than anything you have ever written in your life. And that when we are reading a book, we are reading the final, final, final draft of it. You know, whereas when we're looking back on some of our old writing, like it's not the final draft, it's like the first or the second. And, you know, when we write a first draft and we're like, this is awful. Like if I was a real writer, I would be able to write a final draft in the first go. And it's like, none of the writers that we look up to do that they all have editors or like friends editing or the self-editing you know so we can't judge ourselves on the on the first draft and yeah I think that's a really great point from both of you and I think like destroying the idea of that like idealized what the writer does in a day as well I don't know like because I feel like especially in like pop culture like media is very like yes you wake up and you have your black coffee and your cigarette and you sit on your balcony and you do your little journaling and your little moleskin you know and then you go for a walk in Europe like and you're like no <laughs> no like that's not how it works it's not that glamorous you know like yeah I've done my here. best writing like four <laughs> glasses of wine deep yeah. 11 p.m when I know I have a deadline <laughs> two days later like that's been some of my best writing <laughs> cool yeah. all right well does anyone have any final comments that they'd like to make on on this topic of cultivating care or would like to speak I, I know that we had a lot of other things that we <laughs> wanted to to touch on but um did anyone have any maybe like advice that you would offer to some of the younger writers who are watching this session like what are some ways of implementing care or boundaries just some like top tips that you would um, recommend that you've learned over your time when do you want to kick us off yeah sure um I think the one that I'm living through right now is just to to stop like to to act actually get up and walk away and think about yeah because like turn your brain off every now and again um if you feel like you're doing too much or you're not really sure what the focus is anymore. Um, and that it's also okay to not have it figured out in that break. Um, probably just means you need a longer break. Um, and that is also okay. Someone else. <laughs> <laughs> I have been thinking a lot lately about doing versus being. And I think that kind of draws together quite a few of the themes that we've touched on in this discussion 
Um, so I think for most of my life, I've been in a very doing mode. And Navo, you mentioned that sense of urgency that we can often get caught up in, like, oh, you have to say yes to everything. You have to be ticking off tasks every day, otherwise you're going to fall behind, you're not going to make it or you're going to miss out on a, an opportunity. And I think that um, that is such an illusion because I think from my own experience, you can get kind of caught up in this doing whirlwind and it can get a bit mindless and you're kind of finding that you're just, you're doing and you're ticking things off on a checklist, but you can end up kind of running in a circle a little bit and not really going in maybe the direction that you want to go. So yeah, I guess lately I've been trying to shift into a being mode, which is more just about sitting back and acknowledging that, hey, you know, a lot of the stuff that happens to me in my life is actually um, not within my control. And I find that quite freeing in many ways that I just have a small part to play and a small section of my life that I can control and I'll just do my best within my capacities, trying to figure out what my boundaries are and focus less on, you know, that doing and getting things checked off a checklist and more on just being and experiencing life and slowing down um, and taking breaks. Because I think that um, in the long run is better fuel for my creativity. Yeah, I really love all of the things that <laughs> both of you have said. And I think for me, like a really big one is just taking a minute before I say yes or before I respond to something and actually breathing into like what will that look like what does it feel like where do I think it could go is the money worth it do I actually have the capacity to do that right now and where does it feel in my body like do I have even the slightest inclination that it is a waste of my time and if so should I listen to that and I think that that was also advice that I would have gotten at the National National Young Writers Festival ages ago where it was like saying yes to everything is not in your best interest like it is a it is a breadth over a depth and you will become a master of none you have to actually think about where you want to be and like what are some of your goals and if you can see those opportunities taking you in that direction follow that but like it's not it's not worth the other those other things and you know and especially with your creative practice like it could be worth getting another job so that you don't have to be hustling so hard to write all the time and then bleed the passion out of that thing that you hold, you know? Um, I have work hours now. I know that that's not like available to everyone, but like that's something that lockdowns kind of taught me is like, actually, no, I don't work on weekends and no, I don't work in the evenings unless it's like for a community thing or something I really want to do. And I actually charge extra to do that now. Um, I don't take writing gigs that ask me to write so much for barely any money like I'm not interested anymore if I wanted to write for free I would write the pieces that I actually want to write you know and and you you might be better off saying no to those kinds of opportunities so that you can work on your own projects and try to get them in other places so saying no spending time with your friends thinking about what really matters to you putting your feet into the grass and going for walks in the forest and breathing before you answer people's requests and remembering that their urgency is not your urgency just because they have a deadline that they need to find a writer for doesn't mean that you have that deadline cool all right well that brings us to the end of our conversation thank you all so much for being here for listening we hope that um we've given you some hot tips for for cultivating care and being able to breathe into that space a little deeper and i'm sure these are conversations that will continue to happen over the festival um, check out some of the other programs that are on the <laughs> program at the moment watch some of the panels and the workshops and if you are in person in newcastle um, i will see you around <laughs>